Okay, thank you. Um, hello to everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, greetings from South Australia. All right, uh, if you can turn to John chapter one. I had to talk about uh, bearing witness of the light or God's light. And uh, in a world that's very dark at the moment, um, we are the light of the world. And uh, the Lord can draw people to us uh, to hear his gospel. And I was thinking about a time in history in Europe that was called the Dark Ages, whereby uh, there was very little understanding of the things of God. Uh, it was a time when the Catholic Church pretty much ruled Europe, but um, the Bible was actually in Latin and only really a few educated people or the priests could actually read uh, the word or read, even understand Latin. And so they pretty much were in control of the narrative as far as God was concerned. And uh, it was a very dark time on the earth. There was uh, uh, books were burned. Um, actually, people believed the world was flat back then. And when we look at the world today, uh, we find that the world has become a very godless place again, and there's very little uh, of the word of God faithfully preached once again. It seems to have its own narrative, and uh, that's where we come into the picture because we can uh, tell people around about us uh, about the God that we know and understand, and um, it's a time strangely enough, when people believe the world's flat again, which is interesting. But uh, what we can put across is the word of God. So if we read here in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the Lord um, was there in the very beginning, and his word is what the earth was established by. And it says in verse 2, and the same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light but was sent to bear witness of that light. So the man, John the Baptist, uh, was sent by God to bear witness of the light. And he acknowledged that he wasn't the light. And uh, really, we're in a similar situation. We bear witness of uh, the light of God, uh, but we are not that light. But we emanate that light when we speak of the words, words of God. Um, it's interesting that we have a young man in our shop at the moment that's uh, been baptised but hasn't received the Holy Spirit. And uh, we have long discussions at our work. And he said to me the other day, he said, when I look at you, sometimes I see a light around you or around the outside of you. And I said, well, that's not me. That's the God that's within me. And he, it's interesting that he could see that. and. Um, I praise the Lord for that. And it says here in uh, uh, verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So, of course, we know this is talking about the Lord Jesus. And he came unto his own, and he, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold the glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know that the Lord came into the world, the word of God made flesh, and he walked amongst us. And it's interesting that it talks about not born of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And 
I find it interesting in our world at the moment when we look around us uh, that the world seems, seems to think they have the answers to everything and that all the answers must come from mankind. And uh, I find that a very sad uh, indictment on the world that we live in, in a world of darkness. Uh, the world needs the light of God and it also needs the word of God. But sadly, it's not uh, being given to them. So we'll have a look at uh, Mark chapter 9. So, of course, we don't promote ourselves. Uh, we promote the Lord within us. Uh, all of us came from different situations. Uh, all of us have uh, natural talents, I guess, uh, that the Lord can use. But really, the greatest one of all is that we have the Holy Ghost within and the understanding of God. In Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 17. <clears throat> uh, it's just a particular story that happens here in verse 17. It says, one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which is a dumb spirit. And wheresoever it taketh him, he tears him and foam, foamus and gushed with his, uh, gnashed with his teeth and pined away. And I spake to thy disciples and they sh should cast him out, but they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straight away the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, uh, wallowing and foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child. So this poor man had suffered even from a child of this particular affliction. And it, it tells us here that it's a, a spirit or an unclean spirit, it's like. But in verse 22, it says, Off time it cast him into the fire and unto the waters to destroy him. And it would cast him, do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Sorry. If thou can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straight away the father of the child cried out and said unto him with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that's a great. Um, verse in the bible uh he said i believe but help my unbelief so in other words give me the faith to see this happen and um the lord certainly answered that prayer in verse uh 25 it says when jesus saw that the people came running together and rebuked the foul spirit saying unto him thou dumb and deaf spirit i charge thee come out of him enter him no no more unto him and the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch as many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. So in a sense, people are dead in trespass and sin as well. And the Lord's hand is there to lift people out of it. Many of us, I know myself, uh, I was dead in trespass and sin. Uh, but the Lord was gracious enough to lift me out of that situation, fill me with his spirit and give me a new life. And uh, it says, and when, verse 28, when he had come unto the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So the Lord actually gives us a bit of a clue into how to um, involve him in situations sometimes where it doesn't seem to be working. And he lets us know that prayer and fasting will bring about a different outcome sometimes. So maybe it's a choice we need to make in different situations uh, and the Lord will deliver us. The Lord, of course, uh, fasted for 40 days and... Um, he really prepared himself for his ministry. And um, he's given us a bit of a clue here about how to approach him in times of real need. Fasting has always worked for me personally when I've got into a situation I can't 
seem to be getting an answer to. And uh, when you fast, you're actually moving away a bit from the flesh and moving closer to the spirit. Um, but sadly, now mankind is very puffed up and they don't seem to seek God in any way, shape or form uh, for any of the answers. And then it's a dark time where the word of God is not uh, coming to the fore anymore. Go to Psalm chapter 8. Uh, yeah, chapter 8. People are looking to the wise ones of this world and to give answers for every situation, but in actual fact, the wisdom of God would be far more profitable for them. Um, we'll just read a little bit about who God is and who we are as a fact. So verse one, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent thy name is in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings have thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mayest still the enemy and the avenger. So in that verse, it's actually saying out of the mouth of babes and out of the very young um, that the answers come from. And that's really talking about a humble attitude towards God to realise who God is and who we really are. And I think that's how we have to approach God as well. And it says in verse three, when I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers and the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visiteth him? So what are we as human beings compared to God? Um, certainly we shouldn't get puffed up with our own importance. Uh, we should consider that God is our is the God of the creator of the universe. And sometimes I think that we need to get that into perspective and certainly do as humanity um, in dealing with God. And it says here in verse four, uh, five, sorry, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with the glory and honour. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, yea, beasts of the field, fowls of the air, fish of the sea, who has a pass it through the pass of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So the Lord's given us dominion over things as humanity, but he made his son a little lower than the angels and he sent him uh, amongst us, uh, but he will have dominion over all things. And uh, that's amazing that the Lord had done that. He's, he's made the word of God flesh and he's walked amongst us and he has showed us the way of his salvation and he has showed us the way to live our lives. And uh, it's an amazing thing. It's something that we could never take for granted that the Lord was willing to do that. If we go to Acts chapter 17, so <clears throat> read about the uh, Apostle Paul and um, his dealings with those around about him. He was trying to bring the light to uh, the darkness around about him. And he went looking for people to speak to. And that was his desire uh, to share the gospel. And um, he was a man that had come out of a, a situation where he persecuted the light as such. Uh, but now he realized uh, what he had. And in verse 16, in this particular story, now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw a city wholly given to idolatry. And when you look that up in the dictionary, idolatry is a worship of something other than God in place of God or as though it was God. So we usually get an idea that, he's, that it's talking about idols and um things to worship as such. But if you bring that into the modern era, uh, it's really anything 
that takes the place of God or is worshipped even as God. And uh, there's plenty of that around about us at the moment. And uh, when you love the Lord like we do, it actually makes us feel similar to what Paul did in that situation. And so in, in verse uh, 19, um, he got the opportunity to speak. Uh, it says, and they took him and brought him to R-O-P-X. I'm not sure how that goes. Saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bring a certain strange thing to our ears, and we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. And when you read that scripture, you almost get an impression of what the internet is now. Uh, somewhere where you can see something new or um, share something new. Um, and that's, I guess, why we get to watch cat videos and things like that, because they're something new. But people are actually wanting to know certain things and they've got a, a desire for it. And in verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotion, and I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So a bit like the Dark Ages, um, the people that were filled with the Holy Spirit, and there would have been some, were presenting an unknown God. And just like we are today, uh, the God that we present is unknown to most of the inhabitants of the earth. Even when they think that they worship him or that they think that they build a temple for him or, or whatever, we're actually bringing into that place, as we heard in a testimony there before, uh, an unknown God, one that they know nothing of. And uh, in verse 24, he goes on and he says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. So could we build something that was fit for God to dwell in? Uh, the fact is no. He wants to dwell in us and we become his temple. And 25 says, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So he doesn't actually need mankind's input. He needs mankind's output. He needs us to talk about him rather than us help him out in a sense of getting things done or anything like that. The Lord does all that for us. Uh, all we got to do is trust in him and he helps us with our unbelief from time to time. In verse 26, he has made one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth. He has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. It's interesting that people talk about the empires of the world and uh, people living in different places and all of that. And sometimes we put it down to our own, uh, we almost barrack for our own countries and things like that. But when we read this scripture, we realise that God has appointed people to the place where you live. That's your place. He's done all of that. And even in the world at the moment, with the wars and things like that, he oversees all of that as well. He's in control of all of that. And all we really have to do is just preach the gospel to people. In verse 27, it says, and they should seek the Lord if happily he might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any one of us. That's an interesting thing, that even when we were in the world, the Lord was there nearby, and he was watching over us and watching us until the time when we actually called on his name. And he filled us with the Holy Spirit. He was never that far away. And he's never that far away from anyone. So the fact is that anybody can seek the Lord and he can be found of them. Um, 
that's such a great blessing when you think about it. Because I look back over my life after I received the Holy Spirit and I saw how many times the Lord delivered me even before I knew who he was. And it was for this day when you would come to meet, be with him. And it says here in um, verse 29, for as such as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone or graven by art or man's device. And you'd have to look at the Vatican and think what's with all the gold and the silver and the artworks graven of men's device, because that's not what God does. Uh, that's not what he wants. He's not interested in that. And in verse 30, he sums it up. He says, at the times of ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all of men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he ordained, we're giving assurance unto all men that he has raised him from the dead. Now, that's the interesting part. It says God winked at it when all those times passed, when people were doing all of those things, but now he calls everyone to repent. You know, all of the people of the earth have had their own worship and their own ways and all of that. God allowed that, uh, but now in this New Testament time, he calls everybody to repent uh, because his son has come to it. Well, there's a day when his son will judge the earth in righteousness. So all of those things are gone by the wayside. It's only now that the Lord wants to bring to pass these, this judgment day, which we can see approaching. Um, it says afterwards that some people believed and others didn't. So regardless of all of was said, it still comes down to it. Not everybody believes, and but some people do. I'll just quote Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. It says, through faith, we understand that the world was framed by the word of God so that the things seen were not made of the things which do appear. So if we're looking for answers down here, we need to actually look into the word of God because all of it is controlled by things that we can't see. So we just need to do the things that we can see. Um, we'll go to... Uh, Isaiah chapter 44. had several discussions with people of late that believe in evolution and they believe in all these different ideas and all of those ideas don't have God in them and it just amazes me when I talk to them how they can think they can look around themselves and see the creation and believe that it all happened by accident and I've had many discussions with them about the inner workings of human beings um, and just the ecosystems around about us are just amazing. And yet people can believe that they happen by accident. Um, but of course, some believe and some don't. Um, Isaiah 44, verse six, says, thus say the Lord, the King of Israel, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. So the Lord's really saying, I'm the beginning and I'll be there at the end. So there's no other gods as such. As much as mankind wants to present them, he's the first and he's the last. So we'll go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. People trust in their own abilities 
but as I've gone along in the Lord, I've realized to trust less in my own abilities. Um, to use the words of John the Baptist, he said, uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. So that if we keep that kind of an attitude, then the Lord will bless us even the more. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we have also, oh, sorry, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It may be a race, but uh, we win in the end. But it says there that we just have to be patient. And we need to look back to the cloud of witnesses, which the Bible is a cloud of witnesses of people that have gone before us. And uh, even in our own lives and our own walk in the Lord, there's people that have gone before us and uh, helped us on our way. So we just have to be patient. Because in verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amazing when you think about it. Where it says here, the joy that was set before him, uh, he endured the cross. And you'd have to know that there was no joy at all in his death on the cross. But the joy is us sitting here reading the word of God today. He could see that afar off. And he endured the cross for that reason, despising the shame, all of those things. What an amazing uh, Lord we worship and we follow after. And a great cloud of witnesses, as it said there, have gone before us. Um, go to Revelation chapter 1. Okay. And verse 17. Um, yeah, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. That's he talks about here where John, uh, the disciple, had been praying in the spirit. And uh, on the Lord's day, it says, so he was in captivity on the island of Patmos for preaching the gospel, for uh, bearing witness of the light. And then he saw this vision of the Lord um, here in verse 17. It says, when he saw him, I fell at his feet as dead and laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. So the Alpha and Omega, the author and the finisher of our faith. Um, there he is. And he said, I am, am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. Write these things which are, thou hast seen and the things which, thou, uh, which are and the things that shall be hereafter. So it's an amazing concept that the Lord has won a victory over death. And really that's the... What more is there? Uh, all the things that we can go through in our life, the greatest victory is death. We, and he's won a victory over death so that we can live forever. You know, he's the author and the finisher of it. I often tell people about the gospel and say to them what they need to do and they, they argue with you. They say, oh, it's not necessary to do this or why do I have to do that or whatever. I said, well, I don't make the rules. I just tell you what they are. Uh, we don't actually judge people. What I often say to them is, well, the Bible says this. Or the Bible says that. I don't judge people particularly. I just tell them what the word of God says. And those words are true and faithful. We'll just finish up in 2 Peter chapter 1, just a couple of verses. <laughs> So, of course, we bear witness of the light 
And uh, as I said there before, from the we're not the light. It's the Lord. It's it's His story. And uh, I say about history is is His story. And if we don't believe it, we're history. And um, that's one way of putting it. But it's been his story since the very beginning of time. And it's his story at the end. And we're part of it. And Second Peter chapter 1, and it says, oops, that's First Peter. It says in verse 17, For he received from God the Father honour and glory, when there came such a voice unto him, an excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This voice which came from heaven we heard. This is the disciples. And when we were with him on the holy mountain. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto the light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. So when we become those that bear witness of the light. Before that, we didn't know anything about it. Um, I often say to people when they pray for the Holy Spirit, I say before you receive it, you will have questions, but after you receive the Holy Spirit, you will have answers. And that all happens within an instant of us receiving the Holy Spirit. Suddenly we know that the Lord has risen from the dead and that he is alive. And it says here, verse 20, it says, Know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but of holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it's the word of God. And um, it's a sure word of prophecy, especially in this coming time. There's no private interpretation. Um, we're all given an understanding as according to the word of God. Uh, when people think that they have a private interpretation, then that's when you really need to seek the Lord um, because he has made this, um, he has brought it to our attention. And uh, the gospel that we have is the gospel of life. So all we got to do is just preach it. And uh, especially in this time of darkness, because we shine out even more because of this darkness and the Lord can draw people to us. So let's preach the gospel. It's, um, it's the Lord is the word and this is his word. And all the people said, amen. I'll hand back. <laughs>